Every child has a right to read. I'm coming to you to talk to you about something I recently learned at a school board meeting. There was a representative that spoke up for the teachers who first of all needed so much support in the reading program they were trained in called Orton Gillingham, whatever the name of the company is that trains them, teachers need support. Parents want to be heard. Parents want their teacher, the teachers to be trained properly. And parents want their dyslexic children to receive the help. So what I see are the three problems that I want to help you with right now. The first one is teachers aren't recognizing dyslexia. So I want to help you know what to do to recognize dyslexia. And then I'm going to share with you what to do when you recognize it. So if your students are functioning a little bit lower than some of the other students, there's actually an average, um, you know, there's things you're teaching that your students should be able to learn. It, dyslexic children have average to high IQ. So if you can carry on an intelligent conversation with them, but they're just not performing in the reading or the math or their spelling, there's an issue. So I've designed a couple of pre-screeners that are available on Teachers Pay Teachers and people are buying them. I've made them really cheap, but I'm gonna just share with you what I've done. You can do the same thing. Recognizing that kids with dyslexia will add and omit letters, add and omit syllables. They won't be able to um, spell uh, the letters, the days of the week, the months of the year. They don't capitalize their letters when they should be, and they don't punctuate their sentences. So if you give yourself a list of words, for example, I have two lists of words. One of them is for second through fourth grade, and one of them is for fifth through 12th. So this is really going to help you. I want you to think of the word hair, how we spell it. It's actually a homophone, right? But I'm thinking of H-A-I-R. Change the first letter to be a B, bear. Then cut, C-U-T, add an L, clut. Tame, change the first letter to R, and you have rain. Must, change the first letter to C, cussed. See, these are the words that kids don't realize there's rules, there's grammar tricks when you have a C-U, it's a k sound, not s. So then we have, um, say, care. So instead of the c, put a k. I have turn, change the t to an s. Say calm, change the um, c to a t. Say any. Instead of a n y, let's write e n n y. Then tape. Change the T to a V, a V. And instead of A-P-E, let's put A-I-P. So we have V-A-I-P. How about the word clap? Change the K to a P, clap. And toy, anytime you have O-I, change it to an O-I. That's what we want the children to recognize with familiarity because they've created those sorting like file cabinets in their brain, OI, the OI or OI, and what words go with those sp particular spellings. So those are just some of the nonsense words I've created for grade second through fourth. And I'm gonna give you some of the words that I put in my sentences. I have six. I want you to create a sentence that has the word drink and milk in it. And then create a sentence that has the word seven picnic, seven and picnic in it, okay? You create a sentence that asks, asks, what are you two? And you finish your sentence. Um, write another sentence that say people and my father. And then another sentence, nurse and early. So that one might be more familiar. Her first nurse was early, the different sounds of er. So that's for second through fourth grade. Now for fifth through 12th grade and to adults, try these words. Write uh, the word hearth, 
and or hearth and then change the h to p perth what about the word bees but instead of the s put a z what about the word uh, clap but move the l before the p what about the word please instead of the se put z and take out the l so it, it's peas what about um you could put moisten M-O-I, but let's put, in, instead of S-T-E-N, put M-O-I-S-S-I-N. What you're looking for are those vowel teams. Are, have they learned the vowel teams? And, and how can you help them with those very particular, unique vowel teams? Say the word purse, change the P to J. So they have jurse. And then we could have um, L-A-B-E. I have, um, how many words? I give 50 words to the older students and I only give 24 to the younger students. So some sentences, I want you to create your own sentences so you can learn how to do this. Um, in your first sentence, use the word clam and ocean. You create a sentence for that. Your second sentence, the word rushed and cottage, okay? Kids don't always know that ED is past tense of rushed. They want to put a T. So that's what you're looking for. Third sentence, gathered and circle. Kids have a hard time with LE, consonant LE or EL. That's what you're looking for. Um, what about number their fourth sentence? Population and put a number 40 or 50,000. See how they spell that number. 50 is a hard one for kids to learn because the word five isn't in the word 50. It gets morphed. So then another sentence, um, we met to determine. You create a sentence for your older kiddos. And then I like this one, mound of donuts. Are they going to spell donuts like Dunkin' Donuts? Or are they going to spell O-U-G-H-N-U-T-S? Mound of donuts. So those are just a couple of tips how to create your own pre-screener. If you like what you see, but you just don't want to do it yourself, go to my Teachers Pay Teachers and order it there. It's under $5, I think. So also, teachers need to know how to recognize dyslexia. That's how you recognize it. These are the bright kids that you love talking to. I remember having students that used to erase the, the whiteboards for me or help me put students' work up on the bulletin boards. And they were just so fun to talk to, but they couldn't read or write or spell. And uh, they struggled. So those are those dyslexic kids. And I didn't know that when I had earned my second master's degree. I didn't even know that. So now you know. Now... What's next? The problem is if you're in the public school, do you have the support of your administration? And can you have a staff development or a professional development day where you can talk about these pre-screens and that you can talk about some of the support I offered? I have two types of support and I'll tell you a little bit more about that after I address some of the other issues. Because a lot of the public school teachers don't feel confident speaking up. That's why they had a rep represent them anonymously at a school board meeting because they don't want to lose their job. Sometimes, man, jobs are very risky. If you're not tenure and you speak up, you could lose your job. And I get it. So um, I'm now I'm going to talk to the private school teachers that you can bring it up because it's not an issue in private school. When my kids were in kinder and first grade, my daughter had to stay after school two or three days a week for maybe a month or two and learn phonics. And she's a bright girl. She's actually a nurse right now in neurotrauma at UCLA. She's bright, but in kindergarten, she struggled with those vowel teams and learning phonics. It's very tricky, So, but it's fun. And, and actually seeing her learn was what inspired me to get my teaching credential. So my daughter spent a couple of days after school with her teacher, and that was encouraged in the private school setting. Now, also my son between kinder and first grade, 
they recommended he go to summer school because he wasn't reading at a level he needed to, to be successful in first grade. So I remember him going to summer school after kindergarten. So, or maybe it was after first grade, but I remember it was recognized when he was a little kid and um, little kiddo. And I'm so glad. Now, if you're at a charter school, which I used to teach middle school, charter school in Los Angeles, and I was able to use any phonics program that I wanted. And it just so happened that I had completed my doctorate using music with a phonics reading program. And you can tell kids in middle school and high school love their music. And I could discipline them in a way where we set some boundaries. They could listen to music in their left ear. And at that time, we were okay letting them listen to their playlist if the volume was low and it didn't distract them from their studies. Now, some students got very distracted with the music and you just saw them wanting to rock out or not do their work. Well, that was a boundary they, they crossed. So they weren't able to use their music. Other students listened to the music as I taught them. And now the classes were way too big when I was teaching 23 to 25 kids how to learn vowel teams, how to manipulate plastic letters, how to do phonogram cards. Those kind of class sizes are ridiculous. But when I could work with a class size of five, um, that was amazing. And I could, um, not a class size, but I could pull out five students and I could work with them. Now, sometimes that was too many because sometimes one or two need very specific one-on-one -on -one intervention. So you need to get the support of your administrator at the charter school. And I had such support in Los Angeles at the charter school with Kim Woods. I'm going to give her an attaboy because I just loved her. So, um, and the kids were making great gains in reading. So, okay, so... That is the first issue. Teachers need to know how to recognize dyslexia and what you can do with dyslexia, how you can help the kids because it's gonna be different in private and charter than in public. And I get it. Just get the support of your administration if you can. The second thing is there are teachers who have been trained with Orton-Gillingham and it's very rigorous and they need more support, but it's very expensive. And it's very time consuming. When I was a private uh, public school teacher for 10 years, I didn't need more money. It would have been nice, but what I needed was more time and I needed more help because what was happening with me, I would train my instructional aides and then they would get pulled to work in other people's classrooms who didn't have any aides. So it was very frustrating feeling like your hamster in a wheel training the aides to be really helping your students be dynamic and successful. And then they would get pulled. So what, what teachers need is to have um, this extra support offered at a staff development or, or PD, we would call them. And we were always trying to think of what should we do next week? What should we do next week? What should we do? You know, we were always trying to think of the best things to do. So why not let your administration know that I have created some training videos. I have videos that support if you have had Orton Gillingham training. And because I've had over 200 hours in my practicum. So I actually started Cintron Orton Gillingham Institute, Reading Institute, to support you in your Orton Gillingham training. So what I do is show you um, how you get started in, with easy three steps and then how you review and how you move on teaching new concepts, but how you cut the, the time in half for planning, because when you plan an Orton Gillingham lesson, it can take an hour and how it's going to shorten your lesson planning to 10 minutes. And I talk about the ABCs of OG. It's a book you can buy. I used to have a stock of them and, and offered to sell them to you at a discount, but People weren't taking me up on it. So I've returned those and you can get them from um, the vendor. But they're on, it's on my website, which is dyslexia-solutions.com. You can find out how to get that ABC of OG book, which gives you spelling words. It gives you um, the words with those very specific vowel teams, or we call them different skills. 
and you can um, give a, a screener to your child or your students and find out what um, skills they need help with. And they group the kids to learn those skills together and have a small group of three or five. It would be great. So then the other thing is, um, if you just need Orton Gillingham training, you might have a bonus from your school that lets you do your own professional development. Well, I have some training. You could have that Orton Gillingham support training, but what I have, which I think is even better, is my step-by-step -step reading program because it introduces a lot of skills and they, they um, are very compatible to learn together. And we use music with my step-by-step -step reading. Now I've made the app free. I have a music app called CDSM. The music app you play, uh, the music plays in the left ear, classical music. And in the right ear, it has spelling exercises. Now the app is available for anybody, second language learners, adults who want to practice with it. But it's, it's intended to be used with my step-by-step -step reading program because in order to understand phonics and phonemic awareness, you do need to learn the drills, practice the drills, the multi-sensory steps that help you understand the concept. And that's how we're retra retraining the brain. We talk a lot about the plasticity of the brain. And 20 over 20 years ago, when I met a neurologist and he knew I was using music, he said, you have tapped into something that's amazing. Music helps the brain more than we could even imagine. Keep doing what you're doing. So if you're someone who just needs the initial startup, how to train dyslexic children, it is a program for dyslexic children. It's not um, a reading curriculum to teach kids without a learning challenge. So we're, we wanna retrain the brain of a learning of, of a dyslexic child because they just learn differently. So we have teachers need to recognize what dyslexia is, how do you find it in your students and what's the next step that depends where you're working, what your next step is gonna be. Secondly, if you've had Orton Gillingham training, maybe it was years ago, maybe you had to drop out for some reason, but you just want some additional support, I have that program for you uh, to support you in that. And then the third thing is, if you have not been trained at all, and I know there are schools that are dyslexic schools, and I've heard that the teachers aren't even trained in Orton Gillingham, and I don't even get that because parents are leaving the state, enrolling their kids in schools that don't even in dyslexia schools that don't even have the Orton Gillingham trained teachers. So the science of reading is what we call it. There is a method to the science of reading. Um, it's multi-sensory, it's kinesthetic, visual, auditory, and um, emotionally sound. Kids have to feel like they're understanding and knowing that they're making accomplishments, and it has to be cumulative. The steps need to be sequen sequential and systematic and structured. All those are the part of the multi-sensory science of reading, Orton-Gillingham model, and there are some very popular models out there already, and they may be affordable for you, but they're not affordable for everybody. I have made my program so affordable. I'm here for you, Dr. Marianne Sintron. And if you're someone who could pay this forward so that my videos continue to get out to other people, then a donation for you would be very much appreciated. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And um, I don't want to add too much information, but one of my other videos talks about how to help adult dyslexics teach yourself. So I hope you listen to those videos as well. So reach out to me at dyslexia-solutions.com. Let's have a discovery call. And if you are someone who is in a situation needing support, write in the comments of this YouTube what kind of support you're needing. Okay, bye-bye now and God bless you.